Next, Israelis confront an unyielding opponent, themselves. The town of Bet Shemesh in Israel. It is home to many ultra-Orthodox Jews, known as the Haredi or the Haredim. Other religious and secular Jews live there as well. The community has become a flashpoint of religious tension. Women have been at the center of the unrest. Just yesterday, a crowd of religious men surrounded a car driven by 27-year-old Natalie Mashaya, who had run to her car to escape them. They smashed her windows, punctured the tires, spilled uh, bleach inside the car. She told police she thought they were going to set her on fire. That attack was apparently precipitated by what they considered to be her immodest clothing. Last month, Haredi men heckled and spat on an 8-year-old girl for the same reason. Others were outraged when a woman and refused to sit at the back of a bus on a route the Haredi considered to be theirs. Many secular Israelis are uncomfortable with the segregation of the sexes in Haredi communities, and they are increasingly resenting supporting Haredi men who don't have paying jobs so they can study the Torah full-time and who are also exempt from serving in the armed forces. In the past month, Bet Shemesh has seen both Haredi and secular Israeli groups protesting against what each believes are infringements on their rights. Many Israelis feel this cannot continue. Dr. Enat Wilf is a member of the Knesset for the Independence Party. She is the chair of the Knesset Subcommittee on Israel and the Jewish People within the Committee for Immigration, Absorption and Diaspora Affairs. And Dr. Enat Wolf is in, Wilf is in Tel Aviv. Hello. Hello. Um, there are those who say police have been turning a blind eye to the segregation between men and women in Bet Shemesh for some time now. Why would that be? I think it was part of an odd uh, and problematic adoption of the liberal multicultural idea that a liberal and open and multicultural society has to tolerate uh, the traditions, uh, behaviors of closed societies, even if those societies have intolerant and illiberal values, just because these are so-called their traditions or their religion. And I think like in many places around the world, there is a kind of awakening from that idea that if you tolerate intolerant attitudes in small communities in the name of tradition and religion, ultimately it affects uh, the society at large. So the Haredi community does believe this is a religious issue and a religious right, Uh, um, but you don't see it that way. Absolutely not. And we must um, we must be fair to say there's a whole spectrum of beliefs and behaviors among the ultra-Orthodox Haredi community. Uh, there are those that uh, combine modernism and equality between men and women with tradition and religion. And there are those that have adopted, I would say, a fundamentalist attitude that is in many ways alien to Judaism and maybe comes more around from... Um, influences from the region in which uh, women are kind of expected uh, to dress uh, in very odd ways and to stay at home and really uh, be treated as second-class citizens in in the name of tradition and religion. I view it, of course, as merely a reinterpretation of religion uh, in light of a backlash against modernism but that's my interpretation. Well, and, you know, we have seen um, ultra-Orthodox living next to very secular Israelis um, over a long period of time, obviously, in Israel now. Why do you think we're seeing such a push for segregation between the sexes right now within certain elements of the Haredi community? I think a big part of it is backlash against trends of modernization uh, in the other part of the ultra-Orthodox community. What we're seeing in the last uh, decade, even two decades, more and more women are going out to work, getting an education, uh, getting high-paying jobs, and this is beginning to influence the relationship between men and women, uh, the power structure, And I think uh, what you see is a backlash among some of the more extreme elements against it. And one of the ways that the backlash works is by thinking, coming up with ways to segregate women. It's also in many ways against men because ultra-Orthodox men are also in greater numbers integrating into the greater Israeli society. And those extreme elements who view integration as a threat 
one of the ways to put up higher walls is to come up with insane rules about the contact between men and women that essentially make it impossible for an ultra-Orthodox man to go get a job, serve in the military, and become a part of society. Mm, because uh, there is a traditional side of the uh, the ultra-Orthodox community that's been under fire for the fact that men in that community choose religious study over paid work um, and choose not to go to the army or, or don't believe they should be in the army, right? This has always been uh, a big problem in Israeli society. It's just that the numbers are now becoming unsustainable. Um, I'm sure you've heard about the social protests in Israel over the summer. And one of the old jokes in Israel that had a bit of a renaissance with um, social protests is that in Israel, a third of the people pay taxes, a third of the people work, and a third of the people serve in the military. It's just the same third. And one of the issues increasingly in terms of social justice, uh, the sense of fairness in Israeli society, is that there's a group, a big minority that is becoming a bigger and bigger minority uh, of ultra-Orthodox Jews who do not uh, see themselves as part of the larger society, who to say the least have an ambivalent relationship to the state and to the idea of the state of the Jewish people, and uh, they uh, oppose it. And one of the ways uh, they oppose it is by not serving in the military and even developing a whole ideology that it's okay uh, to take, but it's not okay to give. It's interesting what you say about, uh, um, you know, the, the, the population breakdown, because the other part of that is that demographically, the ultra-Orthodox are uh, an increasingly larger part of a number of cities. Absolutely. I mean, uh, obviously, they have a higher birth rate. It's, uh, again, one of the problems when you have the meetings of a traditional patriarchal society meeting with the modern welfare state, that often uh, spells disaster. And uh, what you have are larger families that are able to um, make a living, if you call that, from uh, social security, from living off the state and uh, enjoying the health benefits as a result um, the families are large all the children that are being born make it to maturity and this meeting of a tra traditional patriarchal society with the modern welfare state ultimately means that there's a far higher growth rate for that society and that begins to have an impact on the society in large on the power relations and on the sustainability of the arrangement in which a small minority expects the mainstay of society to kind of carry it on its back. So how would you like to see the Israeli government deal with this issue? Ultimately, I think uh, it's all a matter of incentives. Take away the incentives and the society begins to change. The ultra-Orthodox society in Israel would never have grown so large if it would not have been for the generosity of the Israeli welfare state. And ultimately, I think what we need to do is just pull the plug on the benefits. It's one thing to have unemployment insurance or to help people when they are during periods of duress or poverty. But a welfare state cannot create a situation where 10, 20 percent of its people make a living off the welfare state. There would be those in your country who would find that very provocative, given that one of the reasons they're not working is because they are studying the Torah. That's perfectly okay. I'm actually all in favor of the old Ben-Gurion uh, vision. I mean, this is an arrangement that started with Ben-Gurion following the complete annihilation of the world of Torah study and the Holocaust. The thinking was that the state of Israel as part of its responsibilities, has a responsibility to help uh, revive that world and recreate it. And that's perfectly okay. Ben-Gurion talked about 400 such uh, super students. I'm all in favor of that vision, but what we have is a complete uh, abuse of that vision to make it a whole society rather than, ju than just the best and brightest. The protests have been ongoing. What are your fears if this tension isn't resolved soon? I mean, change must happen. As I said, the current path is unsustainable. The only question is how will change happen? 
Will it happen through slow accommodation or will it happen through some big flare up? And of course, it could be a combination of both. What I am happy about in the current events, and especially because it had to do with the status of women, is that the majority of Israelis are putting their foot down and they're saying these are not our values. We're no longer willing to turn a blind eye, even in small societies that uphold these values. We no longer accept that liberal multiculturalism means uh, turning a blind eye from intolerant attitudes in a small, closed society just because they claim that it's tradition or religion. And I think what I found wonderful is that in many ways, re Israelis have shown that the equality between men and women, in their view, is, shall we say, they have a religious attitude towards that value. And I was uh, very pleased to, to see that. Okay. Well, you know, Wilf, thank you very much for speaking with me. Thank you. Inat Wilf is a member of the Knesset for the Independence Party and chair of the Knesset Subcommittee on Israel and the Jewish People, which is within a committee for immigration, absorption, and diaspora affairs. She spoke to us from Tel Aviv. My name is Yehuda. I grew up in Los Angeles. My father's a rabbi, and I study Torah in the area. We're feeling very threatened. Now, most of these people, let's say, for example, bus drivers, taxi drivers, they don't know, so they hear the radio saying that the Haredim are terrible, they're bad people, they're black. So, of course, they feel very insecure, they feel very threatened, and it's understandable, but it's, it's not us. Some people in the government that feel that any opportunity to antagonize the Haredim is, you know, they grab onto it. So. I wouldn't consider myself part of the Haredi community, not part of the Haredi community. I'm just a Jewish person living in Jerusalem. But, um, but I do know that um, I have had insights into the Haredi community in Jerusalem, and there is a lot of value placed on women that I think people from outside of the Jewish, com outside the Jewish community, outside the Haredi community, don't necessarily understand. Well, many who belong to ultra-Orthodox sects feel these incidents are giving them all a bad name. There are as many as 700,000 ultra-religious Jews or Haredi in Israel. They believe their separate communities are not well understood by other Israelis. Avram Crozier is a Haredi rabbi and advisor on Haredi issues to the mayor of Jerusalem, which is home to the country's largest ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. And we've reached him in Modi'in Elite, just outside Jerusalem. Hello. What do you make of the latest tensions between the Haredi community and um, uh, other Israelis? I think there are different norms of behavior between the Haredi society in Israel and the non-Orthodox Israeli society, and those differences cause tension from time to time. This tension sometimes makes radicals act out, making for bad publicity, making it into a big deal. Do you see that there are extremists within your own community then? If I answer for the entire Haredi society, then the answer is yes. In any sector of Israeli society, there are those who are mainstream and people who are extremists. The same goes for both the Haredi sector and the secular sectors. Well, where do you stand when it comes to the segregation of the sexes? It is important to know that the Haredi society has been keeping its traditions and way of life for centuries. Our school system is considered to be the best, with minimum violence, no strikes, and many other good things that we have been perpetuating for many years and that we have no reason to be ashamed of. We think that in public spaces everyone should respect one another and act democratically. Segregation of the sexes should not be imposed but it should be allowed in an area that is already proper, if the people want it that way. So, in other words, the segregation of um, a bus, a public bus in a place like Bet Shemesh, is not something you would agree with? If it is a bus which only serves Haredi population, then segregation should be allowed. But it should not be imposed upon the people. But those who ride this bus should choose to respect the way people ride it. If not, there is a bus going on the same route, which is not for Haredi population, and every person may sit where they please. Again, no one is forced to sit anywhere. People should simply use their brains and think things through. I think bus routes, which go into Haredi neighborhoods, who are used only by Haredi people, should be allowed to segregate.
בלי לכפות על אף אחד שום דבר אחר. A lot of attention was paid to the incident where an orthodox school girl, a religious girl, was spat on and heckled by a few Haredi men in Bet Shemesh for what they deemed to be her immodest or improper attire. What did you make of that specific incident, Rabbi Crozier? Those are exactly the extremists I mentioned before, who acted in an unacceptably violent manner. Violence should never be used to voice one's opinions, not against an 8-year-old girl nor an 80-year-old man. Violence is never the way, and whoever uses violence does not go in the way of Judaism or in the way of the halacha. I still say that the media has blown this issue out of proportion, and it had an interest to do so. I was part of making peace between the school and the Haredi neighborhood, and the media incited the conflict again. Well, I, I, I want to ask because uh, specifically these were, uh, both of these cases were religious Jewish women, Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, females, who... Um, who were deemed, I guess, not to be religious enough. And I'm wondering, in your own community, how much is this becoming an issue? Do you see people breaking off? Are you, uh, is there a worry that people aren't becoming, uh, aren't religious enough? It is important to know that the student who went on the bus was aiming to provoke, and her behavior was improper as well. I think most of the Haredi public is a sane, normal, non-violent public who does not walk the streets telling people how to dress or how to behave. We simply ask to live by our own traditions and belief, out of mutual respect. There isn't a radio special every time a man kills his wife or when other crimes are committed, because no one thinks that one or two cases make the entire Israeli society criminals. That is why these stories need to be taken with a grain of salt. The current atmosphere is one of tension propagated by the media, but the Haredi society respects even those who have different norms of behavior. You know, the Haredim in Israel traditionally have had their own neighborhoods where most other Israelis, including secular Israelis, have understood and have respected that the rules are different in your neighborhoods. But your families are bigger than theirs. And your numbers are growing. And as your families and communities expand, do you see changes in how the Haredim are seen by other Israelis? Certainly. The Haredi sector is the fastest growing sector in Israel, which is why we are very intimidating. I can give myself as an example. I serve as the advisor for the mayor of Jerusalem, who is not an Orthodox. 30% of the city council is comprised of Haredi Jews, and there are many debates about how the city should be run. But at all times, there is a common understanding that the city belongs to all Jews, and we have to learn how to get along and respect each other. As long as we don't let the extremists influence us, we can survive together in a dignified manner. How do you respond to the criticism of the Haredi community uh, that it doesn't contribute to Israeli society because so many Haredim do not participate in the army, uh, they do not have paying jobs, and they do not pay taxes? First of all, those who study the Torah should not serve in the army but those who work should serve. We preserve the millennia-old Jewish tradition, and thanks to that tradition, there is a reason to live in Israel, our biblical promised land. Had it not been this way, I would have gone to Canada. I think life there is good. We are a part of society in every parameter. We pay indirect consumption taxes. We are more than 10% of the local market. Our women work, and a big part of the men too. I understand the criticism about the fact we don't serve in the army or work, but I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. It is estimated that 65% of working age of uh, working age Haredi men do not have paying jobs. What do you think the implications of that will be for Israel if the population continues to grow, but so many are not actually in the paid workforce? Due to our way of life, we take up less of the tax money. 
We don't play sports, don't go to the cinema. The bigger the sector gets, more people want to work. As an advisor for the Kemach Fund, which gives scholarships for Haredi people who want to go to universities, already there are more than 7,000 students using it. Ten years ago, there were none. Um, you make the point that you don't use as much tax money as others. Uh, your critics would say you only put in 10% of all the tax revenues. I think it's a part of a process of demonizing done to the Haredi sector. Because of the data I know, as a public server in Jerusalem, for example, the Haredi schools are short, a thousand classes for students, we buy more food than other sectors because we have more children, so we pay more food taxes. I think that if you look at the big picture, we don't give a great deal less, and we definitely get less. How would you like to see the Haredi community move forward on this issue? We have no aspirations to run the country. We just want to live in peace. I think Ahmadinejad does not see the difference between Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews. And that is why all the sectors in Israel should try and cooperate. Doing so would also make it easier for us to get the support of the Jewish community overseas. We have survived for many years and we will keep doing so for many years to come. The yeshivot will not close and people will learn Torah. Some people will go to work and some won't. We have to learn to respect and cooperate with one another, and we can always believe in God, and if we look out for one another, He will look out for us too. Rabbi Crozier, thank you for your time. Thank you. Avram Crozier is, uh, in translation, obviously, a Haredi rabbi and an advisor on Haredi issues to the mayor of Jerusalem.